Beneath the Mediterranean, Mount Etna's underwater slope is shifting on a scale never seen in modern history, an unprecedented movement. 15 cubic kilometers of Earth on the move could unleash a tsunami in minutes, echoing a disaster that destroyed ancient settlements thousands of years ago. Emergency alerts are quietly going out, but sensors are already recording drops of four meters and accelerating tremors. How did we miss the warning signs? And is it already too late to stop a catastrophe no one has faced before? At precisely 0312 UTC, a deep ocean sensor anchored 2,000 meters below the Ionian Sea registered an abrupt four meter drop in the sea floor. This was not a routine anomaly. The instrument, part of a long-term geodetic network, had undergone its last calibration just six weeks prior, with redundancy checks confirming its accuracy to within millimeters. The alarm triggered an encrypted alert to the monitoring lab in Catania, where technician Marco Russo was on the night shift. His first response was skepticism. A reading of this magnitude could mean a sensor malfunction, a tripped cable, or even a passing submarine. But the system's internal diagnostics showed no sign of error. All secondary sensors on the string remained operational, with no interruption in power or data flow. Russo initiated a manual verification, cross-referencing the time-stamped displacement with backup logs and a secondary seafloor pressure gauge located 200 meters upslope. Both instruments recorded the same sudden drop down to the second. Russo's next step was to check for seismic activity. The regional seismic network had not registered any earthquake strong enough to explain such a dramatic shift. That left only one explanation. The seafloor itself had moved. He documented the event, including the raw data traces and sensor health logs, and escalated the finding up the chain. Within an hour, the data had been relayed to the National Geophysical Institute where a team of analysts began reviewing the calibration records and the sensor's deployment history. The chain of custody for the data was airtight, installation photos, GPS logs, and maintenance reports all matched. No technical fault could account for a four meter vertical change at that depth. By dawn, the event had been classified as a verified geophysical incident. The timestamp 0312 UTC became the reference for all subsequent analysis. In the following hours, technicians confirmed that no similar readings had been recorded at neighboring stations, narrowing the event to a specific zone on Etna's southeastern submarine flank. The sensor's depth and distance from the coast placed the displacement squarely within the area already identified as structurally unstable in previous marine surveys. What had been a theoretical hazard mapped in contour lines and probability charts, now existed as a single, undeniable data point. A four-meter drop in the seafloor, captured and verified by multiple instruments with no technical explanation, except the movement of the Earth itself. The unstable portion of Mount Etna's submarine slope is vast, larger than many cities, and stretching across the seafloor in a block scientists estimate at 15 cubic kilometers. This mass is not just sitting still. Over the past several days, remote monitoring has captured it shifting at a rate of 40 centimeters per day. For comparison, typical movement in this sector rarely exceeds two centimeters per month. The numbers alone defy what volcanologists consider a warning threshold. Late volcanologist Dr. Alessia Romano studies the bathymetric models and notes the sharp contrast. She says that anything above a few centimeters per month is cause for close observation and that 40 centimeters per day is unprecedented in their records. She points to the latest velocity profiles, which show the entire southeastern slope moving as a single coherent unit. The displacement is not patchy or isolated, but covers the full mapped extent of the submarine instability zone. The block's geometry, mapped with high-resolution sonar and confirmed by autonomous underwater vehicles, reveals steep escarpments and fault lines running parallel to the coast. 
The southern boundary is sharply defined by a fault ridge north of the Catania Canyon, while the northern and seaward edges are less clear hidden in a blind zone where current sensors cannot resolve the full depth or lateral spread. This uncertainty complicates any attempt to estimate the total potential energy stored in the moving mass. Subsurface mapping shows that the block sits atop layers of fractured, low-density rock, remnants of earlier landslides, and volcanic debris. These weak layers act as a glide plane, allowing the overlying mass to accelerate under gravity's pull. The velocity readings, plotted against historical data, show a sharp uptick in movement. While previous slips were measured in millimeters or a few centimeters over months, the current rate is more than 10 times faster than the highest previously recorded episode. Romano emphasizes that such acceleration is not just a curiosity. The scale and speed of this movement mean that a tremendous amount of potential energy is now poised above the deep Ionian basin, with only the friction of the glide plane holding it in place. As the block continues to shift, the risk of a sudden release grows. The numbers, 15 cubic kilometers and 40 centimeters per day, are not just statistics. They are the physical signature of an evolving hazard, one that defies previous patterns and pushes the limits of what current monitoring systems were designed to detect. Tsunami simulation models for Mount Etna's submarine slope start their countdown the moment a collapse is detected. The calculations are not theoretical. They are built on high-resolution bathymetry, real-world landslide volumes, and the precise geometry of the Ionian seafloor. The unstable block, estimated at up to 2.5 cubic kilometers in the most credible scenarios, would shear away from the volcano's southeastern flank and plunge into the deep basin. This sudden displacement of rock and sediment would force a massive volume of water upward converting gravitational energy into a wave front racing for shore. The simulation clock begins. At zero minutes, the slope fails. Within the first minute, the crest of the initial wave is already forming above the collapse zone, shaped by the steep underwater escarpments and the narrow canyons that channel energy toward the Sicilian coast. The Catania Canyon, a deep trench running just north of the block's southern boundary, acts as a funnel, focusing the energy directly toward the city. At minute three, the wave is fully developed, a wall of water up to 20 meters high at its peak, pushing outward in a widening arc. By minute 10, the leading edge of the tsunami is less than 30 kilometers from Catania's port. The bathymetric contours of the seafloor accelerate the wave, compressing it as the water shallows. Computer models show that in this scenario, the first major surge would reach the city in 18 minutes, barely enough time for a civil protection alert to reach the population, let alone for a coordinated evacuation. The difference between a successful escape and catastrophic loss is measured in seconds. At the shoreline, the wave height could range from 10 to 20 meters with the exact value depending on the total volume of the slide and the angle of detachment. Even at the lower end, this would be enough to inundate the historic center, sweep through low-lying neighborhoods, and disable critical infrastructure. The energy does not dissipate at the Sicilian coast. As the wave radiates outward, it loses some of its height but maintains destructive force over hundreds of kilometers. Within two hours, surges of three to five meters would strike the coasts of Greece, Libya, and Tunisia. The timestamps are not arbitrary. These are outputs from the most recent hydrodynamic models, which incorporate the region's complex underwater topography and the potential focusing effects of submarine canyons. The models are sensitive to input parameters, slide volume, detachment speed, and slope geometry but the central message is consistent. In the event of a massive submarine collapse, the warning window for coastal populations is measured in minutes, not hours. For tsunami modelers, the numbers on the screen are not abstract. Each minute that passes on the simulation clock translates to decisions in the real world. 
how quickly to issue alerts, which evacuation routes to open, and how to prioritize emergency resources. The countdown is a reminder that with a hazard of this scale, the margin for error is vanishingly small. Long before modern sensors traced the shifting slopes of Etna's underwater flank, the Mediterranean coastlines bore silent testimony to devastation on a scale few could imagine. Archaeological teams working along the shores of southern Italy and eastern Sicily have uncovered thick, chaotic layers of sand and gravel wedged deep inland beneath Bronze Age settlements. These are not the gentle deposits left by river floods. Instead, the sediment sheets stretch for hundreds of meters, blanketing fields that once supported thriving communities. Their structure is unmistakable, coarse marine sand mixed with shell fragments and pottery shards, abruptly interrupting the orderly layers of human habitation. Radiocarbon dating of organic material trapped within these deposits points to a cataclysmic event approximately 7,200 years before present. In one coastal excavation, a team led by Dr. Elena Greco uncovered a wedge of sand over one meter thick, pressed between the remains of two distinct habitation layers. The lower stratum held fragments of obsidian blades and storage jars typical of the early Bronze Age. Above the sand, the pottery changed, hinting at a new population or a community forced to rebuild from scratch. Laboratory analysis confirmed the marine origin of the deposit. Foraminifera, tiny planktonic shells, match those found only in deep offshore waters. The force required to lift and carry such material so far inland could only have come from a massive tea tsunami. Further evidence emerged from sediment cores drilled beneath the Gulf of Catania. Here, researchers identified a sequence of turbidite layers, fine silt and sand rapidly deposited in a single violent surge. Chemical signatures and microfossil content traced these layers back to the same period as the coastal sand sheets. By calibrating radiocarbon dates from charred wood and plant remains embedded in the tsunami debris, Archaeologists narrowed the timing of the event to the mid-Holocene, aligning with the timeline suggested by coastal discoveries. This ancient disaster left its imprint not only in the soil, but in the abrupt abandonment of settlements and the sudden appearance of new cultural artifacts in the archaeological record. For years, the cause of this devastation remained a mystery. Only with the advent of marine geophysics and sedimentology did the pieces begin to fit. The scale and inland reach of the deposits far exceeded anything produced by storms or river floods. The pattern matched what modern scientists now recognize as the signature of a volcanic flank collapse, an entire sector of Mount Etna's southeastern slope giving way, plunging into the Ionian Sea and unleashing a wave powerful enough to erase entire communities. Dr. Greco's findings, echoed by teams along the Mediterranean, have transformed the way scientists and emergency planners view Etna's seafloor instability. The threat is not a theoretical construct, nor simply a product of computer models. The archaeological record proves that a collapsed tsunami sequence has already happened once, with consequences that rippled across the ancient world. Each sand layer is a warning, pressed into the earth by a wave that left no time for escape. The evidence buried beneath Bronze Age ruins stands as both a testament to nature's reach and a reminder of what is at stake as Etna's slopes continue to shift. At the port of Augusta, a convoy of white vans arrived before sunrise, carrying teams from the National Research Council and the Italian Navy. Their mission was to launch a fleet of autonomous underwater vehicles, AUVS, into the Ionian Sea. Each vehicle, equipped with side-scan sonar and sub-bottom profilers, was programmed to map the shifting seafloor along Etna's southeastern submarine slope. The lead engineer, Dr. Paolo Messina, coordinated the deployment from a converted shipping container packed with monitors and satellite uplinks. He tracked the AUVS as they traced parallel lines across the collapse zone, relaying high-resolution bathymetric data in real time. The goal was to capture any new fractures, scarps, 
or sediment plumes, evidence that the unstable block was still in motion. On land, the Civil Protection Office in Catania worked through the night. Updated municipal evacuation maps were distributed to local authorities under restricted access. The new routes avoided low-lying neighborhoods and funneled traffic toward higher ground, bypassing the city's congested port area. Emergency planners ran simulations, timing how quickly coastal districts could be cleared if a tsunami alert was issued. The head of civil protection, Lucia Ferraro, briefed her team on the latest data from the AUVS. She emphasized the need for discretion, no sirens, no public announcements, only quiet coordination among key personnel. In the city's historic center, hotel managers received confidential instructions. Each was asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement before being briefed on the potential risk. The guidance was explicit. Encourage guests to check out early, avoid discussing the situation with the media, and be ready to evacuate at a moment's notice. One manager described the tension in the lobby as staff quietly rearranged bookings and flagged rooms occupied by families with young children. The sense of urgency was unmistakable, even as the city's daily rhythms continued above ground. Behind the scenes, a silent choreography unfolded, balancing the need for preparedness with the imperative to prevent panic. Access to the most critical data on Etna's shifting seafloor remains tightly controlled. Reflection seismic lines collected during the 2020 research cruises still sit unpublished, locked behind institutional firewalls. Requests for raw sensor traces and high-resolution bathymetry often stall, with researchers citing proprietary agreements or pending peer review. The situation grows more complicated as outside interests claim a stake. Julia Santoro describes repeated attempts to obtain acoustic logs and sub-bottom profiles. She says every time they ask for the full seismic lines, they are told it is confidential or that the data is too sensitive for public release. The rationale keeps changing. Meanwhile, Rumors swirl about mining companies and private contractors operating research vessels near the collapse zone. These groups assert proprietary rights over seismic and geodetic measurements, arguing that their investments in deep-sea exploration entitle them to first access. The result is a patchwork of partial releases and redacted summary reports, making independent verification nearly impossible. Even basic parameters, like the true volume of unstable material or the exact geometry of the Southern Boundary Fault are subject to debate with different teams offering conflicting numbers based on their own restricted datasets. International coordination adds another layer of opacity. In recent weeks, NATO has quietly shifted naval traffic lanes east of Sicily, citing operational requirements. No official statement links this move to the instability at Etna. Yet the timing coincides with increased seismic activity recorded by offshore instruments. Analysts tracking open-source ship movements note that several military vessels have rerouted away from the Ionian Basin, while Italian authorities decline to comment on the connection. Sensor logs reveal fresh anomalies. Every six hours, a burst of acoustic energy registers across the network, but without access to the underlying waveform data scientists can only speculate. Some interpret these signals as signs of accelerating deformation, while others warn that without full transparency, the true state of the slope remains unknowable. The gaps in data are as dangerous as the movement itself, leaving emergency planners to work with models built on partial evidence and unanswered questions. Today, real-time seafloor monitoring remains sparse across the Mediterranean, even as Etna's slow-motion shifts remind us that ancient catastrophes can still echo forward. The line between myth and risk narrows with every new tremor. As coastal populations grow, the price of scientific uncertainty rises. Our future safety depends on the vigilance and transparency we choose now. What would you demand if this coast was your home? Let me know in the comments.